The soft landing. We That's just the soft- had the soft landing. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> rates are done. You know, the Did we see step- peak rates? Do you think we saw peak rates? Maybe 25 just for, but I no, I, we've hit peak rates. Okay. Yeah. And, but I don't think they need to ease anytime soon because that would imply a recession. They'll gradually step down, but the street's ahead of itself. And I think November was the signal it was a soft landing. Hmm. So how do you view markets heading into year end? And what's your outlook for 2024 as far as when we're talking about that soft landing scenario? Yeah, that's the interesting question is I don't think anybody's happy about this soft landing (laughs) and very worried because normally you would think that that means the economy is going to take off, but you don't get that sense. We had a bit of a merger Monday, so maybe the market's coming back that way, but cautious and absolutely neutral on the asset classes. We're not going to take a bet. Fixed income's back. municipal bonds are back, so you can buy and hold. I wouldn't trade. But uh, private credit, there's just not a lot of opportunities. Everything's priced to perfection. It's interesting because there still is a lot of pessimism out there from a sentiment standpoint. And when you square that away with a lot of the consumer spending data that's still really strong, what is it that's really pushing people who have a call going into next year, thinking that the economy is going to substantially slow? What is going to be the catalyst? You know, that's a tough question because I've been predicting a recession for 16 months, so I've been <laughs> wrong the whole time. Well, thank you and for I saying think, that because a no, lot of people are also in that camp and who have not admitted that they were wrong. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll fess up. I've been wrong a lot in my career. It happens. Uh, so I, I don't know what would cause that catalyst. I think the lower end consumer is running out of money when you have weakness out of Walmart, out of dollar store. Yep. Sprint Airlines, Frontier having a few open seats. Maybe they're going to spend at Christmas. They're going to overextend. And so maybe we have a bit of a, a debt hangover in January, February. That's where we feel it. I'm getting nervous because you still see like Spotify today. You still see layoff notices and reductions. We'll wait to see the employment numbers on yep. Friday. They have been surprising us on the upside. So this is also called muddling along. And I, yes. I think in a large extent, that's what 20... 20- 23 was about and 24 will be about all right you've been doing this a long time here i'm not commenting on his age i'm just saying you've been around this he block a, a few experience. times when you see a stock market up 18 19 percent whatever the s p is here but when you back out six seven names and it's basically up four or five percent what does that tell you worries the heck out of me yep i listen to you guys every day so just a plug <laughs> i really do i listen to you every day driving into work California time. time. That's right. Sector. You've been around as long as I've been around. And, <laughs> and I will just say that they, uh, that no, that always causes for concern because yep. we've seen that before in some technology names. Um, and, and this is so extreme with that magnificent seven. So it's not healthy breadth in the market. I think that's another downside. Just as you said, what would cause the market to down turn down? I think it's a high inflation number or an uptick in inflation a worry about employment, and then then everybody resettles their expectations. Gina Martin-Adams, have to bring her up, who over at Bloomberg Intelligence, who leads the equity side, she and her team did research on the concentration when Mm -hmm. you are looking, especially at mega cap tech, and even when there is heavy concentration, there's still time to make money between um, that concentration and when obviously there could be a flip in leadership, but from your point of view, I mean, is there still time for people to lose out? If they're too concerned for too long, will they end up losing out on, on making money? If they're too oh, con- concerned a, about con- Too concerned for too long, Cam. My staff will tell you, <laughs> I've been a permit bear through all of this and it's not worked. Paul, I thought a global uh, pandemic was a bad thing, yep. but I found out now in my career it's a good <laughs> thing. So um, I have been a, a bear and that has not been the place to be. We're, we're neutral on our equity weighting and we have been over this my 16 month uh, uh, bear market prediction and recession prediction because it's too expensive to be out. So I think you have to be fully invested. You have to pay attention to asset allocation again and be balanced. You can't just be in the magnificent seven. So Nobody you say really balanced. Is. What are you advising clients? To how are, to I've been telling people, pay attention to fixed income again. It's back. Rates are up. It's at a decent place to invest. Um, you know, we're, we're not putting new money to work in real estate or in private equity at these levels, just a steady investor in private equity. But really, private credit, it's hard to find opportunities again because the private flip side. Credit. Yep. Paul's yep. very into yeah. private credit. Well, you know, uh, variable rate returns, you've got to do your homework, you've got to look at your credit analysis, absolutely. 
But uh, that's been a very nice place to be because the banks are out. So a lot of the yeah. big pension plans, the Maple Lake in Canada are investing in that area. So what is it for CalSTRS, a typical asset allocation, you know, equities, fixed income, alternates? What's typically been your model? You know, we have adjusted it over time. We're going back into fixed income. Our fixed income got all the way down to 12%. Really? We're going back. Oh, yeah, because there was just no return out of yep. fixed income. Yep. So, you know, equities for a long time was over 50%. That's coming down a little bit into the 40s. Uh, we're going to go to 15 in, in fixed income. But we're also heavily invested, 15 in real estate, 15 in private equity. We've got some inflation-sensitive assets. Mm. Uh, and we have another category we call risk mitigating strategies, a bucket of things, publics and privates, uh, that, that diversify the portfolio. So if you go back to the big picture, we're 80-20 and we always have been. It's just the subcomponents have changed over time. How concerned are you about this private credit business? Because it just feels like we're one or two big blow ups away from everybody's eyes going to private credit saying, oh my goodness, how much capital do these people have over there? I just feel like there's no really anybody look, it's kind of the wild west nobody's really looking at it i hear you i think that uh and you will if you have a recession you'll have some blow-ups and credit because people didn't do their homework uh covenant light will come back as a real concern paying attention credit work has always been about the underlying credit the the due diligence on the construction of the loan that mm -hmm. all still matters and ha always has the big banks have stepped away from that middle market lending and that's why we've been able to come in so yes you're now seeing this wave of capital going in but it's been going in place for about four to five years it's not brand new it's just using that term is more recent i think it's going to be uh, an investable area but it will always have its stories you're going to have your silicon valley banks and your first reserves that's just natural in life so no red flags brewing in private credit from your purview? I don't think so because, you know, spreads are tight. So that's a concern, but spreads are tight in the corporate bond market. Uh, but no, I don't think it needs added regulation. And I think people, I will just constantly caution people, do your homework on your credit analysis. Don't loan money to people who can't pay it back. Ultimately, they won't. California, how's the economy out there? You know, very mixed. People don't like uh, and inflation. And I hate to say, that's a Big state. Oh, so yeah, very like, diverse. I mean, well, and you guys, you know, San Francisco was in the spotlight with APAC. Yeah. Um, not as bad as some people made it out. All the big cities are having trouble with homelessness. Um, Southern California is doing okay. Um, we get hit by higher fuel prices and higher energy prices. Yep. Uh, and I think we're going to be continually impacted by climate change, and people aren't paying enough attention to that. Stronger storms, aberrant weather. How do you incorporate that because we have a like everywhere else we have a big esg focus at bloomberg we allocate a lot of resources to it but it's become politicized in the u.s and i kind of feel like it's losing some of its time in the spotlight at least here in the u.s i know it's different in europe how do you, how does esg go into your investment process absolutely ingrained ingrained into everything we do it's part of our core and our center larry fink said he won't use the letters e s and g that's right that's become politicized the idea of uh, governance risks, environmental risks, uh, employment, social risks still matter, and they're just part of long-term uh, investment risk. And so I think we've got to get away from the initials and the political side and really focus in on long-term business risks, which absolutely matter. CEOs pay attention to this. They just don't use those initials. Just real quick, 20 seconds. Do you think there's a positive correlation between climate change in your investment process and returns? I think there will be over time. I think it is the biggest mega trend, Paul, that we're going to see in the next 10 years. It is absolutely going to dominate the investment landscape. We have to go through a huge energy transition.